So why are we here? Which is not a philosophical question in this instance, but we're here to look at how the business of TV is changing. Um, specifically, we're going to today look at some of the trends that are defining the business that we're all in, which in various ways boils down to one thing, which is content. I've been coming to MIT for 15 years. I'm sure there's people in the room who've been coming for, uh, for even longer. But I think we can agree that the business is changing now at a faster rate than ever before. So whether that's the emergence of SVOD or TV Everywhere platforms, whether it's the rise of TV drama to a point where drama on TV now supersedes film in terms of the, the cultural conversation and the zeitgeist, um, there are new ways that content is funded. There are new ways that content is released. There's new ways that content is sold. Uh, we're at a moment, I think, where the, the fundamentals of the content business are being rethought and being rewritten. The question then becomes, how do you navigate that matrix of windows, of devices? How is success even, how is success even measured in this new world? Uh, and these are just some of the things that we will look at today. Uh, I think it's appropriate that this is the opening session at MIP TV because the idea is that you guys will leave the room and head into the rest of the market having gleaned some key facts and figures and learned about some content trends and specific programs and platforms um, that will help shape the rest of the market for you, will give you really useful, tangible takeaways. Uh, we have a great lineup, so I'll just very quickly do the introductions and you're going to hear more from these guys. Uh, so from Eurodata TV Worldwide in the middle, we have Sahar Bajari, who's Director of Global Research and Content Strategy and, and really is, I think, a recognised expert on the international content business. Nearest to me, we had Frederick Volpre, who, having worked at Canal Plus, Orange and, in fact, Reed as well, is currently VP of Eurodata. We also have, from 20th Century Fox, Michael Pupolo. Now, Michael is in the trenches, so to speak. He heads a team looking at how viewership is evolving and what is winning out across linear TV, cable, DTT, OTT, EST, all of these acronyms and terms that, that have become relevant, I think, in today's world. Um, the presentation we split into three separate parts. So first up, we'll have Frederick, and he will look at TV consumption and usage trends. Then we'll hear from Michael, who will delve into some of the specifics of measuring, measuring viewing in this world, and particularly looking at the US. Then we'll hand over to Saha, and we'll get into the platforms and the content that are, that are shaping this new world. And we'll actually see some stuff. So it's great to actually see some stuff on screen that kind of demonstrates where things are heading. So without further ado, I'm going to sit down and hand over to Frederick. Frederick, if you'd like to come up. Thanks, you want. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Frédéric Volpré, and I'm editing Eurodata TV. And before we start, I just would like to call your attention on, Euro, uh, on what uh, are the key assets of Eurodata TV. Eurodata TV benefits uh, from uh, TV audience rating uh, from uh, 100 territories, and we have in our, our database TV audience rating of 7,000 channels. Thanks to this uh, expertise and uh, unique database, we are able to deliver reports. And every year, we are delivering the uh, one TV year report. And this morning, we are going to give you exclusive results for you from this report. So the first thing we're going to look at is viewing usage. And when we talk about viewing usage, uh, we would like to primarily have a look at equipment and technology. Regarding equipment, there is no surprise, according to GFK figures, the number of TV uh, the number of uh, TV sales have decreased in a recent past. Last year it was minus 11%. But uh, mobile and smartphone particularly have uh, really increased in terms of number of sales. And when we look at equipment rate, uh, we saw that in uh, most of European countries and in Japan also, we have a high increase and high equipment rate. Almost two thirds of the population is now equipped with one of these devices. Second point on equipment is about 4K. 2015 has been the real year for 4K increase. Uh, we, seen, uh, we have figures uh, in some uh, European countries from GFK, and what we know now is one third of the connected TV are now um, you know, and are, uh, 4K TVs. And uh, regarding a forecast for this year, for 2016, 48 million of television sets will be sold as 4K in the coming year. So why this 4K uh, increase is not surprising. More and more now platform and um, 
services are now available or are broadcasting 4K channels. For example, DirecTV in US, BT Sport in UK, or the Russian uh, the Tricolor TV uh, uh, Russian platforms. We also have the SVOD and global partners. Netflix, for example, had announced the production of 600 hours of 4K program this year. And in terms of number of channels, it's going to increase significantly. Uh, some forecasts give a figure of, of uh, 250 channels in 2020. So after equipment, we know that the key challenge of the industry is the evolution of audience measurement. So this is a tricky part. Um, so we know that TV was, you know, is well measured either from live television, from live consumption, sorry, time shifted, or catch up. And on the, on the other side, we have uh, you know, the other screen, which are not necessarily measured in the same way. And the aim as a challenge for the industry is to uh, get to a, a unified four screen measurement. So when we look at history, 11 years ago, in 2005, only UK was measuring time shifted. And now, this is a new map. In 2016, here we are. More countries are measuring time shifted and catch up. And uh, seven countries have announced uh, the, the uh, new TV audience measurement, a four screen audience measurement. You know, it's, it's the country in very dark on this map. So the first country to, uh, countries to measure the four screen uh, measurement will be France, then Sweden, and Netherlands. And later this year, it might be uh, US and Germany. What is also very interesting now to notice, and this is a, a, a figures from our report, it's a positive contribution of time-shifted viewing of the global audience of television. What we have seen in our survey, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, before we go to the time-shifted, I would like to give you the, a key figure, which is the daily viewing time. So every year we measure the daily viewing time. So in 2015, TV consumption remains very strong with three hours and 14 minutes of daily uh, viewing time per individual. And when we look at young adults, we all know that there has been a decrease in the recent year. And the figures is two hours and four minutes, so minus 10 minutes. Uh, and this is explained by the use of more screen. And this figure is measured on 88 countries. So when we look at regional difference, we see that some regions are still very strong. In the United States, we see that four hours and 29 minutes are uh, you know, uh, spent in front of a television, where in Asia, it's uh, much smaller with two hours and 32 minutes. But we see two regions which uh, have now more uh, positive figure with South America and Africa with increasing daily viewing time. And when we look at uh, country by country, don't panic. I will not detail every country. But we can tell you that some countries are increasing, like uh, uh, Uruguay, plus 28 minutes, and also Georgia, with, uh, which is one of the biggest increase, with plus uh, 24 minutes. So we, we still see differences in uh, TV um, consumption. So now, sorry, it's time to talk about time shifted. Uh, so we know that time shifted viewing uh, brings a, a positive contribution to TV consumption. And in our report, we would like to give you an exclusive uh, figure that we have uh, done. So time shifted is measured in 31 countries. And we have been able to give you a figure on 26 uh, countries. What is very in interesting is that the, the, the it brings additional audience. In average, it's plus 15 minutes uh, consumption of TV thanks to time shifted. And we see that thanks to this uh, 15 minutes, we reach four hours and one minute of TV consumption in the world on the total individual. And what, what we would like to point out this morning is the influence on genres. And that's very important and very interesting figure, we think. Globally, and that's no surprise, on fiction, Time-shifted viewing brings more TV consumption with a plus 16%. But what is quite new, and even in our report, we were quite surprised, it's also entertainment now. The entertainment genre is taking benefit of this new usage of time-shifted. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, Thank you, Frederick. It's a great, great scene set. Uh, great to hear about the different screens people are engaging with. Um, now, I'd like to, to hand over to Michael to get perhaps a, a US perspective. So, Michael, I know you're uh, going to take us through some, some interesting stuff. Sure. So, um, right now, you can see that over the last five years in the United States, we've seen a significant increase in viewing 
uh, in the Live Plus 3 metric, uh, more significantly for the U.S. cable networks, uh, but still continuing to grow even for the U.S. broadcast networks. And here we can see on the next slide that less than 50% of the viewing in the United States is done live. When you add in the live plus same day, the overnight viewing, that's about 66% of the audience. And then 92% of the audience in the United States is captured in the live plus three viewing and then 100% in live plus seven. I do just want to make a note that in the United States, the currency is C3, the commercial rating plus three, and C7. Uh, however, the Live Plus 3 and the Live Plus 7 are almost the exact same number, about 75% of the time. So a significant increase in uh, time-shifted viewing in the United States across the spectrum. Michael, do you think, as, as someone who, who knows this piece of the business, uh, you know, back to front, do you think that the, the measurement tools are keeping track with the wider industry changes because... You know, there are, there are new, uh, new windows, new ways of distributing content, new ways of accessing and engaging with content. And I wonder, do, do the metrics keep pace? It's a very interesting question. Um, we feel that so far the Nielsen in the United States is doing an adequate job of measuring that viewing. However, uh, we continue to speak with our partners, uh, with Nielsen and, and other companies, about really moving to what we see as the future, which is not only all devices, the four devices that we spoke about before, uh, but also in terms of measuring it all the way up to the 30 days of viewing. And, and currently now in the, in the US, the, the real, the broadcast networks uh, don't use overnights in the same way that they would historically have done. Yeah, and in, in fact, uh, all of the US broadcast networks have stopped releasing um, live plus same day overnights. <clears throat> they're very directional. They either tell you whether you have a big hit or a big miss, but there's so much other viewing going on on so many other different platforms that unless you have a big hit or a big miss, it doesn't really give you any indication as to how the show is really performing with your audience. Do, do the, the, the tools that, that are there currently, do they provide adequate information from the advertiser perspective? Is, is, there, is there a disconnect between the metrics that are delivered and, and what advertisers want to see and, ha and how they, they pay for slots? Well, still in the United States and around the world, uh, television is the absolute best medium to attract a, a mass audience. And so from an advertiser's perspective, I would say that they um, are happy with current television viewing, but there's so much of a broader spectrum of what they're looking at with digital and, and every other platform measured in, but there's still no, nothing that aggregates an audience quite like television. It, it seems that the, the, the way we measure stuff has changed and, and kind of the notion of how we measure success is really changing, a hit. Absolutely. The U.S. broadcast networks this season have been very, very slow to cancel series. They've let series continue to run until they really get a real good sense of what type of audience these shows are actually attracting. Whereas before we could see stuff going after maybe one, two, three episodes. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. It's great to get a U.S. perspective. Um, Frederick, can I pass back to you? Um, what, what are we seeing in terms of, particularly in terms of viewing online? Uh, what we see today, so in, in addition to uh, TV consumption, uh, we see that there is a boom in, uh, in online uh, consumption. And we, have, we would like here to give you some figures from our report. First, we see, for example, in Canada, that 60% of the young adults uh, are watching a program uh, like uh, in the past month. So it's a very uh, interesting figure. Perhaps more interesting in the US uh, uh, situation, where 52% of you know, the, uh, watch online video every day. And in France, which is uh, with different figure, but we see a high increase in TV consumption online. And perhaps one of the most interesting examples we have, and we have done a case study on this um, uh, country, is it's uh, Sweden. Because in Sweden, you know, usually it's a trendsetter in terms of um, new consumption, new TV consumption. And what do we see from this slide? We see that first, there is a seasonal online TV consumption. You know, after the fall, there is a high increase of consumption. And globally, when we look at the figure on the, on the right of this slide, we see a, like plus 20% of online consumption compared to last year, which shows the strength of TV online. And programs like Paradise Hotel, which is an entertainment program, or comedy series, Sol Sidon, it's an old uh, Swedish uh, comedy series, uh, have at the peak, and in, uh, it was in week 42 last year. In week 42, this series program online uh, made uh, four millions of streams in a week in a country which counts 10 million. It, you know, it, it shows you the strengths of you know, now these new types of consumption and the need of a unified four-screen measurement. Frederick, just, just a, a quick question there. Of course, the SVOD platforms have, have really emerged. 
however they're very shy with sharing any data. Is, is it tricky to actually to get hold of this kind of information and track how shows are doing in terms of streaming? Yes, it's tricky. We all would like to have the recipe. I think uh, also Michael would like to recipe to know the precise figures of Netflix. We all try to work on that. Uh, it's complicated, and uh, we we are uh, we try to we will tackle that in a, in the coming days. I'm not sure months perhaps. Uh, thank you. Um, so it's great to hear about the different screens in play and ha and the challenges of measuring kind of the, the way the viewer is engaging content. I think what we have to do now is hand over to Sahar to actually look at the platforms and the content that are defining this new world. So, Sahar, over to you. Thank you, Stuart. Good morning, everyone. So with this uh, overview of changing habits, we see that distribution of content is critical. And we do have recent newcomers um, who enter the circle of content producers. So first, the expansion of Netflix in 130 new countries in January goes with a strategy of local productions. One out of five Netflix originals are produced outside the US. The latest local initiative uh, announced last week being a Spanish original series. And in order to take root in foreign countries, Netflix is closing deals um, with local actors, either calling on high profile companies, such as Left Bank Pictures for The Crown, or the creators of Gomorra in Italy for uh, Subura, uh, or more confidential companies, such as Boutique Filmes for its Brazilian uh, original 3%. This strategy of openness is also reflected in terms of programming genres. For example, one out of three original content launched in 2015 were not scripted series. And for example, Amazon um, was inspired by its acclaimed series Transparent and now explores transgender issues in its documentary series This Is Me. On local platforms, uh, for example, in China, Tencent and IQE especially bet on adaptations of international hit formats such as Sexy Beasts and Worst Driver. And European public groups are the home of creative and innovative takes on the genre, uh, with me, myself, and I um, on Arte Creative in France, and The Men Who Witnessed 219 Executions on BBC3, which was rebranded online in February. Also, a growing strategy to stand out seems to be to bet on genre-based platforms. In the US, Shooter was launched in 2015 by AMC and is a platform dedicated to horror contents. Earlier this year, NBC unveiled its platform Hey You that offers reality shows on demand in the UK, Ireland, Australia. And the 4K SVOD service Love Nature has started providing wildlife content in about 30 territories. Another source of diversification is the arrival of new platforms starting producing original content. Instagram is following the path of Snapchat and PlayStation and premiered its first scripted series, um, Chill 5, earlier this year. And Apple Music uh, is also preparing a fiction project with Dr. Dre called Vital Sign. Broadcasters seize the opportunity to give viewers a behind the scene access thanks to VR, 3D, and 4K initiatives. Proziban aired a 360 episode of its talk show, uh, Circus Illegally, in 4K on YouTube. French broadcaster Arte launched an online project uh, around the author Philippe K. Dick, who wrote Man in the High Castle, that combines virtual reality, 360 footages, 4K uh, quality, and even a video game. And specialized digital actors also enter the content production, uh, such as the Oculus Story, um, the, the Oculus Story Studio, uh, with their second upcoming movie, Henry and the Polish video game developer, The Farm 51, um, who is launch, which is launching the documentary Chernobyl VR project, launching in two weeks. Anyway, everyone is now looking to make content and to generate emotion and create proximity with the viewers through content. So now moving on to international TV trends, uh, let's look at key indicators of content creation. Over 8,400 new TV programs were launched in 44 countries over the past season, 
with over half of them being original national contents. And while the UK remains the world's second exporter of programs behind the US, we note for the first time the arrival of France in the top exporters with programs like Tripalium or Versailles uh, that were sold in many countries. And Turkey boosted its international sales, among which uh, the numerous deals closed with Latin America. Now, in terms of content circulation, North America records a strong regional interflow of 71% of its finished production and feeds Latin America with 38% of the Hispanic uh, regions in sports. Western Europe um, is an important content supplier in Western Europe with series such as uh, Trapped or Yodscot, for example, in Scandinavia. However, imports of Scandi content uh, in Western Europe barely reaches 2%, which proves that Scandinavia is more a qualitative exporter than a quantitative one. And actually, um, Scandina Scandinavia is more an importer than an exporter, as we can see with the circulation of um, Scandinavian content to Western Europe. Also, only 20% of Eastern Europe's content is now circulati circulating uh, within the region because it decreased by 18 points um, since the geopolitical issues between Russia and Ukraine. Africa now not only exports, um, imports Mexican telenovelas, but also imports content, uh, Brazilian content from Globo as well. Um, Latin America is working more and more with Turkey, which is one of the reasons Turkey climbed uh, to the top five exporters, as we've seen earlier. And Asian programs in the Middle East are getting bigger with Indian soap operas uh, making their entrance or um, also special programming occurring during political and special events such as Chinese series broadcast in the Middle East, especially for the visit of the Chinese president in the region three months ago. Now, if we concentrate on fiction contents in the big countries, uh, recent launches have already become international hits. In the UK, for example, Dr. Furster achieved huge performances for the last episode with more than 10 million viewers. In Turkey, Kiralik asks about the son of a wealthy family who wants to earn his own money and becomes a famous shoe designer, uh, managed to rank third in the country. And the reboot of The X-Files by Fox traveled uh, in many countries just a few days after the US launch. Now, if we look at the rest of the world, in Saudi Arabia, the sarcastic black comedy selfie in the Middle East ranks first. Also, the top 10, perf uh, the top 10 uh, best programs in Thailand are all scripted series, and the leading one being the horror series Nang Chada. And speaking of horror series, we have also, we have also <laughs> Sahirat al Ghanoub, which is an Egyptian horror series and, um, that deals with witchcraft and led the rankings in its country. Let's watch a video. perfect amount of scary at 10 a.m. on a Monday. <laughs> we often get some wrong ideas about um, what scripted content viewers are watching in their own countries based on what is sold abroad. So for example, we often think that the British or the Italians watch only local contents uh, for local scripted, but this is not always true. Uh, Channel 4, for instance, is broadcasting more and more foreign series such as Deutschland 83, um, 
and Morpho has launched Walter Presents in January, which is a free platform dedicated to non-UK content on which the Danish series Heartless um, was the second most watched program uh, during the first two weeks of the platform's launch. As regards Italy, uh, there has been an increasing development of Spanish series uh, watched in Italy for the past three years, such as the adaptation of The Mysteries of Laura uh, on Canal 5. Also, we may think that the Germans only make crime series and that Scandinavia is only known for its Nordic noir dramas, but we've seen otherwise. Um, Deutschland 83 may not have well performed in Germany, but it managed to gather 8.4 million viewers in 11 countries, even if it often aired on pay TV channels. As for Scandinavia, it is known, of course, for its Nordic noir dramas, but they have also made successful comedy shows such as Agvarman about a woman who opens a beauty salon. And the strategy of TV4 is to air these comedies on Friday night in prime time between the Dancing with the Stars results and Idol, uh, which gather a peak of viewers. So speaking about comedy, uh, the genre drives strong audiences around the world. Channels like uh, NPO3 in the Netherlands, Channel 2 in Israel, uh, or Telecinco in Spain have in common the important volume of high performing coming series uh, for from two thirds to 100% of their top rankings. And to mention a couple examples, um, the sitcom Neida Efduar from Morocco uh, aired during Ramadan, which is a very prolific period in terms of content creation, and ranks second all genres combined. And also La Famiglia is a successful Israeli uh, scripted comedy distributed by Armoza with a second season commission. Let's have a look. Introducing La Familia, a unique sitcom format about a family with many reasons to be happy. <laughs> and even more reasons to go to therapy, such as their sex life. <laughs> The children. And of course, his mother. Hi. All in a hilarious sitcom about what makes family life so much fun. Na, 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 na. Each episode is made up of a series of standalone scenes. Each episode is a new therapy session in which they bring up the most embarrassing. Awkward. <laughs> insane moments. <laughs> She's falling. <laughs> Adaptations of scripted formats have increased. Siga Asitas is an Argentinian com romantic comedy. Uh, which has been adapted in Spain and Germany and Poland in 2015. For example, we have also um, the German police series Der Letzte Bulle, which was adapted in France, then Japan a few months ago. And adaptations can be very far from the original version. If we take the first scene of Der Letzte Bulle, for example, um, in Germany, the German hero wakes up um, um, after 30 years in a coma, and the viewers don't even know why he was in a coma in the first place. In the French adapted version, um, we see the scene of a gunshot that puts the hero in a coma. And in the Japanese version, the gunshot transforms um, into an explosion. Let's watch a video of these different scenes. So, a hübscher man. No, kannst du ihn ja gleich mal waschen. Dein hübscher man. Der spürt deine Zauberhände sowieso nicht mehr. Das wollen wir doch mal sehen, ob der noch was spürt. Der kleine Don. <laughs> Finger weg, Gewinner. Es darf nur meine Frau. Oh, hab ich einen Schädel. Also, du bist ja ein ganz erfrischender Anblick. 
Ich glaube, das mit dem Waschen überlege ich mir noch mal. But also some adapted, uh, adapt adapted scenes can be really a copy and paste uh, from the original version. To illustrate this, we're going to watch the original British version of Marchlands, which was adapted earlier this year, earlier this year into Le Secret d'Elise in France. Um, let's see. Look what you've done. Me? It wasn't me. Who else could it be? It was Alice. <laughs> so we can wonder and ask ourselves if adaptations are limiting creativity and in fact it's a quite difficult recipe to find a good balance uh, of choosing the right concept, the right cast, uh, the right ingredients to appeal to a local audience. And now about the new hits that are coming up. Uh, if you're a fan of sneakers, uh, Rivals Forever is, is a German family saga inspired by um, the story behind the families of Adidas and Puma. Global Screen has already sold it to Scandinavia and Eastern Europe. And in May, Roots uh, will be launched simultaneously on History, a and &E, and Lifetime. And last, here's a very, very sneak peek of Victoria, the new period drama of ITV Studios. I know that I'm young, but I am ready for the great responsibility that lies before me. Victoria, this year on ITV. I apologize for this very, very long trailer. <laughs> so now let's focus on entertainment content. Long running formats continues to draw crowds, but what is the lifetime of a format? This is not an easy question. Uh, so let's focus on three case studies. Expedition Robinson, also known as Survivor, continues to attract uh, many viewers, despite the fact that it has been broadcasted for more than 10 years in many countries, often stopped and brought back to air. Um, for example, in Spain, after a two years break, the program was relaunched in 2011 and ranked as the fifth best performing entertainment program. And last year in Italy, Canal 5 got back the rights of the program from Rai Duo and broadcast its own version, achieving high performances. Second talent show, The Voice. Despite a progressive loss of audience, uh, it remains the leading program on RTL4 in the Netherlands. And overall, um, it's the format which appears the most in the top 10 best performing uh, programs in the world in about 20 countries. Third case studies, The Great British Bake Off was such a hit on BBC Two that BBC One um, has broadcasted the show since 2014, while the second, the second best performing entertainment format is the Great British Bake Off on M6 in France. Beyond strong brands, we have also unconventional competitions which continue to meet great success. 
In 2015, King of Mask Singer, hiding talent behind sometimes very original or um, ridiculous masks, uh, worked really well, and the Korean format traveled in China. Denmark's Best Mascot was also successfully launched last month. It's a game show that determines uh, which full which football club in, has Denmark's best mascot. So let's look into this couple of unconventional shows. Taber vækstangen, Aros og kaster sig frem endnu en gang den fejlslagende taktik. Og dermed har vi en vinder ikke bare af runde to, men også af elimineringsdysten. Nanok nok er videre i Danmarks bedste maskot, Aros er ude. And coming up also is the legend. We got the, the trailer exclusively from a Global Agency just yesterday. So let's watch the trailer of the legend. On most TV talent shows, it's the jury that decides whether a contestant continues. It's the audience that can change their fate. But what if we gave the power to the contestants so they can write their own destiny and become the legend. In this 16-week competition, it's the contestants who decide if their performance was good enough or not. They have up to three chances to prove to the audience and the jury that they have what it takes to be a music icon. Each contestant has a list of 10 songs they've been practicing, but it's up to chance to determine which one they sing. That's my favorite song. Of the clock. I'm lying here. Now it's up to the contestants to sing their hearts out, and it's the audience that rates their performance. <laughs> the ones who receive more than 80% are safe. It's up to the contestants to decide whether to challenge themselves. I can do better. And sing another song to get a higher score. I challenge myself. Because the higher the score, the better their chance of progressing. If the score is higher in the second song, they get a third chance. You have just shown everyone here how to wow a crowd. They never know their competitors' scores and must rely on their instincts and self-belief. I'll challenge myself again. Also, dating shows continue to be really popular as well. Secret Dates performed quite well in the UK and another, other dating formats are coming up, such as The Single Chef, uh, distributed by Televisa, mixing reality, competition and dating. And Marry Me Now uh, from our Moza formats, where we follow one woman who prepares her own wedding just a few days, um, in just a few days, due while uh, her groom doesn't know about it. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you probably recognize these guys. Um, you have met them all over the last couple of weeks. And that was actually us. We set you up with all of them. Oh, with um, We arranged all the dates for you. And it has all been filmed. All of the last couple of weeks, <laughs> these setups, you have been on camera. <laughs> El ganador será el primero en elegir con qué chicas pasará los próximos días en su restaurante. Allí convivirán junto a él para conocer cada pequeño detalle de su cocina y de su vida. 
Los chefs van a proponer a sus candidatas diferentes retos personales y gastronómicos y solo las dos mejores podrán apartarlos por un instante de los fogones y enseñarles su propio mundo. They will tie the knot on the spot. I don't know how many of you guys would accept to marry your girlfriend if you get ambushed like that. But. So Marry Me Now has already been uh, taken in France, Germany and Italy. So we cannot discuss TV trends without our show uh, mentioning the content watched on the web. We can see innovative kinds of writing and directing on YouTube. First, the Jackass Time is back with crazy challenges. Uh, Dumbas Productions consists of two men uh, making short videos focusing on stunts. The second trend revolves around discovering funny or weird objects from the world and how to use them. For example, the French channel Hugo Pose is, uh, is about that, or the biggest YouTube channel in Japan, Hikakin, with nearly 2 billion viewers. Let's look into these weird objects videos. Pick up Twiddle Mega and get your fingers fidgeting. It's a plaything made up of 175 interlocking pieces. When all the pieces are attached, it's fun to crunch, smooth out, form shapes and patterns, and accessorize. And when the lights go out, your Twiddle sculpture will glow. Uh, according to research, things that glow in the dark are 58% more enjoyable. Confirmed. Push an object. Ça. <laughs> Ongle manucure. Ah oh merde, je dois le gonfler. Je reviens quand c'est gonflé. Oh Bonjour. Oh, j'ai failli taper la caméra. Tranquillement. Bon, on va aller voir qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire avec. Voilà, là je passe. Yaki sama choco. Hi, Kochira. Village Vanguard de 300 yen de kaimashita. これ本当にチョコなの?と思いきや。これ。ああ。ああ、いいにおい。これ、これチョコボール。ヤクサマチョコボールだったのこれ。あ、でもなんかチョコボールより硬そうな音してる。and also, um, YouTube content get inspiration from TV formats. Um, we have Hofmeister, which is um, very, very famous in the Netherlands with 55 million views and time-lapses films uh, that show how people are changing over time. And last important thing, YouTube uses its fans, communities to experiment a new business model and challenge SVOD services. YouTube Red was launched last October as a paying advertising uh, free content platform only available in the US for now. So YouTube Red originals are being developed exclusive only to Red members. In the reality adventure series, uh, Scare PewDiePie from the executive producers of The Walking Dead and Maker Studios, PewDiePie lives really scary situations. Um, the original movie Dance Camp from Awesomeness TV is the story of friendship through the power of dance. And the feature length movie A Trip to Unicorn Island uh, gives fans a look into um, the life of Lily Singh, a famous vlogger, during her global tour. Let's look into these videos. How's it going, bros? This is PewDiePie. And please enjoy this exclusive teaser of my new show, Scare PewDiePie. Oh, oh what the fuck? Fuck you! Oh, 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 this is not cool, man. Are you kidding me right now?
to exhaustion. I will go to the edge of the earth to succeed at what I do. Happiness is the only thing worth fighting for in your life. Thank you, Saha. That was great. I think we, um, I think we truly travelled the world in, in <laughs> 20 minutes or so. Um, kidding aside, we, we really have covered a lot of ground between Frederick, Saha and Michael. And uh, with the formidable task of, of kind of pulling those strands together and giving us some, some kind of final closing thoughts, I'm just going to pass back to Frederick. So over to you, Frederick. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, in conclusion, what could we say? I think it would be better if I... Yeah, with a microphone. So, of course, here in Cannes during three days... Content is king, and that's no breaking news. But frankly, after 10 years of intense digitalization, we can't ask our, ourselves who is the new king. And perhaps you, Stuart, you, Michael, you, everyone in the room, you are the new king. The TV viewer is a new king, and he's deciding and acting as you know, the master of his TV and video kingdom. But as professionals of the industry, we could ask ourselves, what can we do? What, should, what kind of action should we you know, lead? So from our point of view, we could lead several actions, sorry. So first one is to understand, to understand this new um, consumer. And the first action we could take by understanding is we have old metrics, but we're going to have new metrics. And the fourth screen measurement is one of these uh, steps because the consumer is more complex. So we will need more metrics to understand this more complex consumer. The second action, we have to understand new usages because new usages are now the normal and standard usages. We are in a mobile, mobile, mobile world and new technologies such as 4G++ and 5G will make permanent access the normal rule. Third action, we think it's content development and creation and, 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 and development of content. The motto today is entertainment plus plus, whether with platinum quality drama or with innovative format. This MIP TV will highlight very high quality platinum drama, such as Medici, Master of Florence, casting uh, with um, uh, starring uh, Dustin Hoffman, uh, Roots, which will be um, this tonight as a world premiere, or uh, Victoria from ITV. We also have, on, on the other side, very innovative format, and we have identified two main themes, which are feel good, sorry for the slide, feel good, and exploring new fields. But finally, there is a central fact. Who is now organizing and structuring this new media ecosystem? Every day, we, we see global alliances aiming at convincing these new TV viewers. Group, groups like Vivendi, AT&T, ProSibens, ITV are now in a race of a global critical size. The recent buy by the Chinese company Wanda of the Hollywood studio Legendary Entertainment shows that new alliances are involving worldwide players. Today, the GAFA company are no longer the only worldwide actors as traditional players are entering this race. Convincing this new TV king is a global game and is starting this morning at Cannes. Have a great meet, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>